it, it's important once again to look at all this information we have and try and make some sense out of it. What does it all mean? Well, what it's telling us is that it's giving us the clues to try and understand what is, where we're moving to, where we're going as a species. But before we can figure out where we're going as a species, well, I think it's important to understand who we are, where we come from, and why we're here, because that'll give us a lot more answers. And it's only when you know the origins that you can then string a line between the origins and where we're going to, to, to extrapolate a line of, of, uh, that makes some sort of sense to see where we are going. I have a problem with people that just you know, say, well, I don't care about where we come from. The, the time is here and now. Uh, we're just moving in, in this direction. This is what's going to be happening. You, you need, if you don't understand the past, how could you possibly try and predict the future? The one thing we have in our favor is consciousness. And I keep telling this more and more in my presentation, sharing this with people. Consciousness does not discriminate. It affects everybody equally. And because consciousness is a, is a, is a some sort of a strange primordial field of the divine that we are trying to define and understand, it cannot be stopped by rubber clothing or rubber boots or putting yourself into a Faraday cage mm -hmm. to insulate yourself from it. It permeates everything, everywhere, all times. And it, it is now visible and has been shown with some spectacular effect how the, the light, which the ancient civilizations called the great sun, the light from the galactic center, has been identified as a source of what could be called consciousness or a source of, of life, unstoppable generation of life wherever it goes. And with that life comes consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the two are inextricably linked. We need to look at something that is a united, a unified model, which unites people for a united strength, a unified strength where everybody contributes towards the greater benefit of all. Mm -hmm. And that is really the foundation of what I call contributionism, a whole new social structure that operates without money, without barter, without trade, without any value attached to anything, where everybody in their community contributes towards the greater benefit of all. You just need to put this out to the people. This is not going back to the Stone Age or to the Dark Ages. In fact, it is completely the opposite. It removes the hurdle. It removes money from the system. And since money is the hurdle and the obstacle to all progress, you're removing the hurdle to all progress. And I'm talking from whether you're a farmer or a shoemaker or a rocket scientist or whether you're an engineer, you have no hurdles or obstacles to what you want to contribute or achieve. And your passion is. So we will leap rapidly forward uh, into uh, an enlightened mm -hmm. spiritual age filled with conscious people that will have huge amounts of time to pursue their spirituality and the levels of consciousness will explode globally because people have, will have time to pursue the art and culture and spirituality because they'll no longer be chasing money or 90% of the time or more chasing mm -hmm. money so they can pay rent, buy milk and bread and pay electricity. All of that stuff is out of the window with a, a lot of new information. And uh, it really deals with the, the um, origins of humankind, the, the new evidence found and presented, uh, scientific evidence. Who are we? Where do we come from? Why are we here? Why is it that we can't answer those three simple questions? Um, it deals with um, providing physical evidence of lost and vanished civilizations in South Africa and in Southern Africa as a whole. Um, law, and, and we're talking about a very large vanished civilization that we're mining gold. Um, it, it brings in, um, obviously, all areas of science and research, which includes history, it includes archaeology, it includes astronomy and uh, archaeoastronomy, it includes physics and science and chemistry, and also then metaphysics and the new areas of, of research and the frontiers of science that, that very few people are aware of uh, actually exist. Um, and to... I guess to many people, when you start talking about the real frontiers of research and science, to many people that sounds like black magic and hocus pocus, but that's not what it is. It's real stuff that's going on in, in research laboratories. So it's very exciting. Uh, for years, many people have been locked in the box uh, of viewing our real human origins as being uh, the result of Darwinism. Uh, or creationism um, under the umbrella um, in the matrix of, of what's being told in religion. Um, but as many people now know, and even the History Channel is talking about these parallels between the Old Testament uh, and the story of creation, and of course the Sumerian texts, and I believe uh, the Sumerian translation for the first man is Adamu. Uh, and so um, take us back to the, to the beginning, Adam, uh, excuse me, Michael, where all this begins. The foundation of our knowledge today comes to us from the Sumerians. 
And that covers all the subjects from astronomy, mathematics, uh, medicine, um, the legal system, monetary system and accounting, architecture, agriculture. The Sumerians were the first people to embrace the art of writing and write down all their knowledge on millions of clay tablets referred to as the Sumerian clay tablets. So it is, at the moment, the oldest written record of human history. And from these tablets, we get some fascinating information. And this evidence is this vast civilization that lived at the southern tip of Africa, mining gold. Uh, we have the physical evidence of millions of stone structures that were left behind and, and deserted. We have millions of gold mines and many other fascinating archaeological and, and uh, geological sites that just boggle the mind. And I've only found out about this uh, through you, Michael, just several years ago. Like I said before, uh, the History Channel and others, there's, there's a big focus on Egypt, but you point out that there is another connection. Um, in your book, you also talk about the, uh, I believe it's the 31st parallel um, yeah. that connects. Um, what are we looking at here with this, with this lineup of uh, several ancient uh, cities? Well, it's, it's 30, 31 degrees east longitudinal line that connects uh, what we now call or what I call Enki's calendar, and there's a whole lot of reasons for that. I go into those in my presentation. So um, if you know, if I'm skipping over some of these things, there's not enough time in the show, obviously, to go into detail. So just take my word for it. Come to my presentation, and you'll get a lot more detail on this. It connects Enki's calendar, otherwise known as Adam's calendar. Um, Enki's house, which is uh, the wonderful ruin at Great Zimbabwe, and then the Great Pyramid in, of Giza in Egypt. All of those align along the 31 degrees east longitudinal line. And there's some very important specific reasons for that. Um, the, what you mentioned about the link to Egypt, all the structures and the civilizations in South Africa and in Zimbabwe, um, all these ancient civilizations, um, all the, uh, the Spanish civilizations, sorry, um, can be directly linked to all the so-called great civilizations in the Northern Hemisphere. The Egyptians, the Sumerians, the Romans, the Greeks, the Sumerians, the, um, the uh, Phoenicians, and also the Hindu Dravidians, the, the Indus Valley Civilization. All of these so-called great civilizations that we thought were the first great civilizations on Earth, especially Egypt and, and the Sumerians, um, are very richly represented in, among the ruins and carvings of Southern Africa. And this is spectacular because the, the petroglyphs and the carvings of some of the symbols, which includes like the Sumerian winged disc, and the, the, the cross in the circle, and it, even the Egyptian unk are carved in the rock in South Africa. But they're much older than any of these civilizations in the north, which tells us that, that those symbols go back more than 200,000 years in the application at the southern tip of Africa before they eventually were exported and used in the north and in the, among the Egyptians and the others. Uh, what is clear is that these ruins uh, seem to be at certain places uh, on the planet for a reason. What do you think these yeah. stones were used for? Well, um, the, this was the big mystery. You know, what were these ruins in South Africa for? They're all circular. Uh, everyone is completely unique. They are made of very specific stones. And what I'm telling you now is something that's taken more than 500 years to figure out. Just those three simple statements. Now, this is how, how in, incredible these breakthrough discoveries are, because sometimes we forget to ask the very simple questions, and, um, and we try and figure out the complex answers without asking the simple questions. And uh, the questions are, you know, what kind of stone are these, so these stone structures made of? And when you realize that we're dealing with the same kind of stone, predominantly one type of stone, there are some other exceptions, but there are reasons for those exceptions that I've also subsequently discovered. Um, and the reason for this specific stone that they used is because it has acoustic, very strong acoustic properties. And what I talk about in my presentation and show is that these stones ring like bells. Now, when I made that discovery, I realized that it is sound that we're dealing with, sound as a source of energy. And that takes us back very quickly and immediately to the source of creation in most, if not all, ancient civilizations that talk about the word of God, or the primordial Aum, or Om, or, or the singing, that, some sort of singing that created the, the universe, as the Egyptians believed. Um, you realize that most ancient cultures believe that some sort of sound, or word of God, the word of God, that, that created the universe and all things in it. So sound is a primary source of energy in these ancient ruins of southern Africa, and, um, and they used 
out as a source of energy for the gold mining, for the purification of the gold, for the processing, for levitation, for creating the stone circles in the specific shapes that they are, because as I mentioned, each one is completely unique. So that's why the type of stones and the sound frequencies are so key. You know, uh, when I was listening to your interview last night with George Norrie um, on the 14th of June, very good interview, by the way, um, I came across a very interesting BBC article that I, I it just, I, synchronicity, it found its way to me, actually, Michael, but the headline is, Riddle of Baghdad's Batteries. And um, listen, folks, this is the date for this article. It's February 27th, 2003. That's several weeks before March 19th, 2003, the date that the United States invaded Iraq. Um, what this article talks about is very interesting. It reads that Aaron Fraud investigates what could have been the very first batteries and how these important archaeological and technological artifacts are now at risk from the impending war in Iraq. War can destroy more than a people, an army, or a leader. Culture, tradition, and history also lie in the firing line. Iraq has a rich national uh, heritage. The Garden of Eden and the Tower of Babel are said to have been uh, sited in this ancient land. In any war, there is a chance that priceless treasures will be lost forever. Articles such as the ancient battery that uh, resides uh, defenseless in the Museum of Baghdad. And, and this was written, again, several months before the museum was looted, which I'll get to in just a moment. But the article continues, for this object suggests that the region whose civilizations gave us writing and the will may have also invented electric cells 2,000 years before such devices were well known. And so the pictures that you see before you on the screen, um, these are reenactments, recreations of this uh, uh, Baghdad battery. And there are people that have actually put this into application and, and found out that it actually works. After uh, looking at this report, I went back and looked at the other report from the BBC just several months later, and it reads from the BBC News here, looters ransacked Baghdad Museum. Thousands of valuable historical items from Baghdad's main museum have been taken or destroyed by looters. Michael, when I look at these things taking place, it's like um, a parallel script to Indiana Jones and uh, Raiders of Lost Ark. Absolutely, and um, I need to remind your viewers that you know archaeology is not a does not have its origins in a noble profession. It does. It has emerged and in many ways still represents, um, uh, you know, tomb robbing and, uh, and, uh, and treasure hunting. You know, he who has more funding and has deeper pockets will be able to do more things and go into more distant lands and, and explore more incredible ruins and take the loot for themselves. And that has been the case with archaeology for, you know, 200 years now. Sure, he who uh, has the... Uh... He who has the knowledge has the power. Exactly. But the, the whole looting of the Baghdad Museum is obviously a very key moment in human history. And many people believe that the entire invasion of Baghdad uh, and the, the, of Iraq actually had very little to do with anything we imagine, whether it's oil or whether it's Saddam Hussein, but had everything to do with the information and the valuable items that were kept in the Baghdad Museum that are direct links to ancient civilizations, our extraterrestrial technology, our links to, to ETs and, um, and, and, and many, uh, you know, Stargate uh, systems and structures and specific activator key uh, components to activate Stargate uh, technology and so forth. And, you know, as strange and as weird as this may sound to some people, let me tell you what, this is probably closer to the truth than anything else, because y you can imagine there's, you know, imagine in Second World War, Berlin or London, when the bombs started falling. Uh, I think the last thing on people's minds was, hey, honey, let's go down to the museum and take some cool stuff. There's a lot of cool stuff <laughs> in the museum. Let's just go take it for ourselves. That's the last thing that will cross your mind. So the fact that the Baghdad Museum was completely looted and raided and not, virtually nothing left within 48 hours of the first bomb falling on Baghdad is a highly, highly suspicious bit of information. Well, now you're going into another very interesting area. I've, I've read some things by William Henry, and he, he's been talking for years uh, about the potential existence of a Stargate underground in Iraq. Saddam Hussein yeah. is well known, this is documented fact, to have claimed that he was the reincarnated spirit of King Nebuchadnezzar, um, a well-known character from the Bible. And it, it, again, we're talking about Iraq, where all these ancient things have taken place uh, from Babylon. Many things that we're talking about tonight, in addition to Africa, also a place where much turbulence is going on. I really wonder Absolutely. why, Michael, there's so much going on right now in that region, a place of great history. And, and I can't help but speculate if it has any connection with the uh, completion of the Mayan calendar. Uh, all of everything that you mentioned is uh, inextricably linked. And it's important to raise this and make people aware of it. Nothing we're doing today is separate from what the people in Southern Africa were doing 285,000 years ago, 
that is incidentally the date that I've come up with for the, 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 the origins of this vanished civilization, around 285,000 years. There's a number of reasons why I say this, but we, I don't think we've got enough time to go into that, but there are a number of scientific and geological evaluations that I've come up with um, and found that give me a, a deep sense of comfort to be able to say that. Um, and all of that in South Africa and Southern Africa is directly linked to what we are doing today, how we're being manipulated, what our level of knowledge and information is, and how we are coming around to complete this weird full cycle that the Mayans have been talking about and predicting, the, the reaching of the, the conclusion of one age and the beginning of a new one. And this is spectacular information because what we now know, and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the, the measurements as well later that we have made in the stone structures in South Africa so people know that I'm not just making this stuff up. We, we know that they were energy devices because we've measured it and they're still active energy devices right now as we are speaking giving us huge amounts of energy, far more so than the Baghdad batteries. And I need to just come back to that, uh, Alex, very briefly. The, the Baghdad battery kind of technology is already a, a, the beginning of the, the post-Diluvian period where the total control of the human race has, was already implemented through the, the hierarchical system and the feudal system that was introduced to the Sumerians by the high priests and the kings, as the Sumerian tablets tell us, when kingdom was lowered to earth from heaven and priests and kings were appointed by the gods. And that's a very important part in a point in human history, because it is at, at that point that the control and disinformation began. And we are now at the, the zenith and the apex of that control and disinformation. And therefore, we are finding people like you and I and millions and millions of others that have reached the point of, sorry, I'm not going to believe that anymore. I need to find out the truth for myself. So the Baghdad battery is actually part of the disinformation with the new the new era of so-called technology that was given to the humans prior to that the technology was directly linked to free energy the energy that exists freely around us everywhere and that makes up the entire universe remember the first thing we get taught in science and physics is that energy cannot be destroyed it just converts from one form to another and the entire universe is one giant ball of energy and so why are we paying for it because it was it was uh, developed so that we have to pay for it and we can be controlled through the supply of energy, which today we call electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, but that is not what people like Ed Lee Skullman, who built Coral Castle, used. It's not what John Keeley discovered with his musical Dinosphere in 1888. It's not what Nikola Tesla gave the world. They gave the world di a, a, a different sort of energy, a free energy, which is many of them refer to as radiant energy. And that radiant energy is crucially and inextricably linked, once again, to the, the stone circles in South Africa, um, who, which are still giving us huge amounts of this radiant energy. Uh, it, is, it is visible and measurable in, in forms of electromagnetic waves, in sound frequencies, and in heat signatures, but there's another aspect to it that we are completely unfamiliar with, that we, we don't understand how these three aspects fit together. Uh, it's, it's just spectacular. We, as, as you said, the Mayan calendar is coming to a close or the predictions of this, the, uh, the age mm -hmm. of the this age that the minds predict will come to an end in 2012 certainly and a new age will begin and what what's happening is that our, our desperate quest for free energy is now taking us to these new areas of understanding that we are learning from the ancient civilizations in southern africa this is spectacular and as you were talking um I was uh, having a recollection of, uh, of my interview with John Searle, and he created something called the SEG Generator, and it's based on yep. free energy. And in the interview, he said that the information came to him in a dream from an ET. Uh, people also theorized about Tesla perhaps tapping into the collective consciousness and coming up with these ideas, which is why many people, Mike, are optimistic about the future, um, even if there was some sort of a meltdown of, of the grid as it currently is today, uh, the potential that this knowledge, even if there's no electricity and the internet is disrupted, but that the knowledge will still be out of the Pandora's box, if you will, and, and it will continue no matter what happens. Um, but I, I just want to mention really briefly, um, we uh, read some news recently about the largest solar flare in five years, and we've been reading more reports about solar activity and there's a lot of interesting information about what that actually does to the human body, um, the impacts of it, um, and, and the planet, links to increased earthquakes and volcanic activity. Um, NASA released um, um, a updated projection on what they think we're going to see out of sunspot cycle number 24 and 25. One of the things they said is that um, in this cycle, even C-class flares and M-class flares uh, will do more uh, uh, to disrupt the grid. Um, 
uh, charged particles uh, coming into our atmosphere having its effect on the Earth in a stronger way than Sunspot Cycle 23 due to a weakening magnetic field. And this is all timed with um, the Mayan calendar, N not the end of the world, but a point of great significance where it appears to me that the planet is going to be bombarded with lots and lots of energy. And so yeah. this, is a, this is a very, very interesting time, especially when we have mainstream admi admissions more and more every day that there is something going on up out there that's changing. And uh, despite the fact that NASA is involved in lots of cover-ups, there are other reports coming out about um, these stars they're finding um, and storms on Saturn and other planets uh, warming up, in fact, uh, over the course of the last several years. So it's, uh, yeah. it's an exciting time to be alive. It truly is. And, you know, it, it's important, once again, to look at all this information we have and try and make some sense out of it. What does it all mean? Well, what it's telling us is that it's giving us the clues to try and understand what is, where we're moving to, where we're going as a species. But before we can figure out where we're going as a species, well, I think it's important to understand who we are, where we come from, and why we're here, because that'll give us a lot more answers. And it's only when you know the origins that you can then string a line between the origins and where we're going to, to, to extrapolate a line of, of, uh, that makes some sort of sense to see where we are going. I have a problem with people that just, you know, say, well, I don't care about where we come from. The, the time is here and now. Uh, we're just moving in, in this direction. This is what's going to be happening. You, you need, if you don't understand the past, how could you possibly try and predict the future? Well, my, and, Michael, this is the thing yeah. that people have the issue with. They're trying to understand why any other intelligence other than human would be interested in humans. This is the, and I'm sure you come across this as well. Um, it's this exactly. perception that many people have that, that there's nothing of interest about humans. Why would they be interested in us? And, and there's, there's lots of uh, interesting ways that people uh, look at the situation without considering other possibilities because I'm pretty convinced that chickens um, not to be insulting the chickens, don't fully understand humans and how we control them and how we keep them in cages uh, and how we live off of them for food and how we're, we're pumping them up full of drugs. I'm sure they're partially aware they're in some sort of a, a cage, but I don't think they fully cognitively understand the psychology of the homo sapiens. So, Michael, I, I'm thinking that we perhaps are not in a state of consciousness to fully understand uh, what is truly actually happening around us in the interdimensional reality that we're coexisting with. Absolutely. Very well put, Alex. Well done on that. It's, that's exactly what it is, and, and um, I always say, you know, if, if you're a farmer, you have a flock of sheep, and you don't want them to know what you do after hours, they will never find out, because you're in control. It's as simple as that. And therefore, you know, we for so long have been in the dark, because those that control us have not wanted us to find out. The one thing we have in our favor is consciousness. And I keep telling this more and more in my presentation, sharing this with people, consciousness does not discriminate. It affects everybody equally. And because consciousness is, a, is, a, is a, some sort of a strange primordial field of the divine that we are trying to define and understand, it cannot be stopped by rubber clothing or rubber boots or putting yourself into a Faraday cage mm -hmm. to insulate yourself from it. It permeates everything, everywhere, all times. And it, it is now visible and has been shown with some spectacular effect how the, the light, which the ancient civilizations called the great sun, the light from the galactic center has been identified as a source of what could be called consciousness or a source of, of life, unstoppable generation of life wherever it goes. And with that life comes consciousness. Mm -hmm. And the two are inextricably linked. It's as if uh, the, the Holy Trinity of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit can now be explained with these things, with these three elements that we read in the first mm -hmm. few chapters of the Bible. You know, the word of God, God said, let there be light. So it's the sound, the light, and then this infinite field of consciousness, or the Holy Spirit, if you want to call it that. Mm -hmm. And in science and quantum physics, it can be referred to as the infinite quantum super possibility that manifests the physical world that, or projects the physical world we, we, we call the universe. Um, and, and this is spectacular because more and more of this information is allowing us to understand quantum physics, and cross over and understand the fundamentals of spiritual religious beliefs. And uh, all of this stuff is, again, once mm -hmm. again, it can be directly linked to all the ancient cultures and civilizations and their belief systems and how they use the knowledge of this stuff, these fields, um, um, all over their civilizations and whatever they were doing. Mm -hmm. Now, so, um, the, uh, I just want to say the word consciousness means different things to different people. Um, I, I will say that one way to kind of uh, uh, 
experience this is to pay attention to the synchronicities when it comes to information for myself in different stages of my life different pieces of information came at certain points when i was ready for it or when i was ready to interview that guest when it was time to go into that area and so um as i explore my own consciousness I'm uh, working to be very mindful moment to moment of those synchronicities. Um, and there's many ways to describe the synchronicities that we experience. Sometimes it's being on Facebook, for example, seeing someone's face and maybe a half hour later or a day later, they're saying, hey, how you doing? Haven't talked to you in a while. And I'm talking yeah. to more people, Michael, that are having this experience through the internet, despite the fact that it's technology, many synchronicities seem to be happening through it. And, and this, this massive awakening through YouTube, <coughs> despite the negative things going on, it's very exciting to see that reinforced over and over and over again, that there is a synchronicity out there. And as things, some people feel that time is speeding up or time is altering, but as that happens, our reality alters or things seem to happen faster um, once the thought comes into manifestation. Yeah, look, many, many physicists have spent uh, a lot of valuable years showing that light, uh, you know, we believe that light travels at a constant speed. Well, that is no longer the case. There are many physicists that have that have shown that that is not the case, that light travels at various speeds. It all depends on what dimension and what, what, um, what, what area of consciousness you are involved in or you, you exist in. But this is, this is fascinating stuff because you mentioned the word time is speeding up. And, uh, you know, one of the, the obsessions of, of uh, great physicists have been this, this, this unified field theory and, and uh, whatever that may mean, but the, the unified source from which everything comes and how does it work? And, and the concept of space-time, three-dimensional space, and then time-space, three-dimensional time and one-dimensional um, space, how that line crosses over. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we're getting very, a lot closer to, to understanding that, or at least being in a position to be comfortable with that, because the concept of, of time-space is a very difficult concept for, for, for uh, any human to, to try and comprehend. It is because it's so alien to us, because as far as we know, time is linear. Time starts mm -hmm. with past, present, and future, mm -hmm. right? What is fascinating about this, and I must also add that the work that I'm doing with uh, Willem de Swart, the brilliant um, um, scientist Willem de Swart in Johannesburg, that we've been working on for the last four years now on what we call the secret numbers of God, uh, I believe that, that we've decoded, and predominantly Willem with his brilliant mind has decoded, the, how all this stuff works together. And we can now start to explain with basic geometry and sacred geometry, um, which doesn't mean religious geometry, but fixed geometry, sacred meaning fixed in Greek, mm -hmm. um, fixed geometry by, by the laws of nature, um, how this stuff actually works and why it works. And these numbers and the, the geometric, the numbers beyond the, behind the geometry show us very simply how this huge concept of what we call the, the, the numeric grid that makes up the universe, how it all works and fits together and how it is totally and utterly encoded and, and cross-references. Everything is cross-referenced cross with numbers and numeric grids. It's spectacular. But what it's allowing us to do is also understanding this crossover between space-time and time-space. And it's a spectacular moment in history. What I think is really happening here is uh, what, this, what the, the Mayans actually did very successfully is they, they tell us that time is speeding up and, and it will reach its, its apex point, maximum point in 2012, right? 21st December 2012. Mm -hmm. That's what they say. Obviously, and, and, and the, there are the other theories of when the date actually is, the, but Michael, let's stick to that for, for now, for argument's sake. Well, what happens when the time has speeded up when it can no longer speed up anymore? Hmm. I just wanted to add in, Michael, that uh, the, the solar maximum projection also continues past 2012 into 2013 and 2014. I just want to add that because there's a big focus that it's just 2012, and it's actually a, a cycle of time that we're going through, not, not a particular date. Similar to describing the effects of a full moon, the waning and waxing of a full moon, as it is with uh, the sunspot cycle. Yeah. Well, what I just need to point out to you and, and your viewers is that once, once we reach 2012, if, if the Mayans were accurate in their predictions, which it seems more and more so to me, it's got nothing to do with you know, doom and destruction. What it actually means is that, that we will reach a point in human evolution and human consciousness, our consciousness evolution, where we can come to terms with the concepts of crossing over from space-time into time-space. Because of their prediction that time is speeding up and it will reach the maximum at the specific date, in 2012, which means past, present, and future will collapse into each other and they will coexist. Past, present, and future will coexist. And at that point, we consciously will be somehow uh, more comfortable or, or more able to comprehend the concept of crossing over from space-time 
to time and space. And, uh, and that's a crucial, a crucial moment in human history because that seems to be the, the ability of a lot of the advanced beings that are visiting us on this planet. They can travel through time, which to us is just a completely nonsensical uh, ideology. Okay, you mentioned evolution, and that's, that's quite a bit different than revolution. Anthony Hilder has an interesting quote, we have to have a revelation to avoid a, a revolution. Uh, my friend Leah Lewis from the website uh, fearlove.com uh, writes in her, her new book, Unzipping Reality, she'll be on the show soon. She talks about the difference between revolution and evolution. And as people seek uh, a new system outside of what they call just simply a capitalistic system, which is the very, as you know, Michael, very narrow way to look at what's actually happening on planet Earth today. But as people seek a new system, um, some people are looking still in the old world, communism, socialism, collectivism that still falls, uh, uh, falls under the umbrella of the elite. You talk about something, yeah. and we only have about 15 minutes left, um, contributionism. And... Um, I want to move into that area uh, because you, 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 you've been speaking for hours about this on a number of interviews, and it's not capitalism, it's not socialism, it's not anarchy, it's a different uh, system um, that I'd like to get you to uh, talk a little bit more about. Yeah, thanks. So thanks for bringing that mm -hmm. up, Alex. And once again, um, my, my um, interest in this, in this new system, which I call contributionism, comes from uh, examining and, and uh, researching the ancient vanished civilizations of Southern Africa, how they existed, what they did, and how they then metamorphosized or changed into what we are today and how we humans behave today. Because before the flood, the, I see the flood as a huge dividing line between a pre-Diluvian period, which is very, very strange and foreign to us today, uh, and, and I deal with extensively in my presentation um, and in my new upcoming book, uh, The Lost City of Enki, I'll be expanding on that uh, in, in, in various um, ways. But after the flood, we suddenly see the rise of all these various civilizations. We see the, the uh, appearance of a writing and Sumerian tablets, and suddenly these great you know, advanced civilizations appear all over the world, speaking different languages, uh, being at odds with each other, and the great wars break out. And we realize that, as I mentioned to you before, I, I believe that it is, it is that's actually where the manipulation began. And people do not understand the importance, or underestimate, should I say, the importance of the event of the Tower of Babel event that moment it was a critical moment in in human history that has led to the division that we have uh, experienced as a species but so what what i found is that you mentioned earlier the solar activity and whatever is going on in in space you know one giant solar flare and it and it'll fry all this all the satellites in in space around us and we'll go back to the dark ages within a few seconds and, now, and what will that mean for us it'll mean that unless you've got food and water, you will die. Simple. simple. Um, it doesn't matter how much money you got. I don't care how much gold you got. All the material possessions mean absolutely nothing. It's all about survival. And food and water is the number one. Shelter mm -hmm. is the next thing. So what, what is going to happen if, to society and the human race if that happens? And the chances of that happening are very, very good. Listen to what Nassim Haramein has to say. Mm -hmm. You know? The surface of a planet is not a good place to hang out. It's highly unstable, and, and you know, un, unexpected things happen. Tr Mass extinctions occur all the time. Yes, and, and, and one thing arrogance that... Arrogance is our biggest enemy in this position at the moment. Well, one of the things so, that I've seen uh, over the years, Michael, is this connection between the solar cycle, um, the maximum aspect of the solar cycle, which is three to five years, it varies. And cycles of wars, revolutions, and also changes in consciousness. We saw this during the late 60s. We saw this during um, the uh, early 90s, solar maximum, 1990, 1991 and the, um, in the, the bombing of Iraq at that time. Uh, 10, 11 years later, uh, we saw the stage managed event of 9-11, uh, and it appears those, uh, those that are in power place that event at a particular point on the solar cycle. Uh, when uh, yeah. it's been described by many people that have looked at the solar cycles and its tidy human behavior as, as a time where human excit excitability is peaking, when there's more activity. Um, yeah. But it also leads me to, to believe that we need to be very careful about what thoughts we're projecting at this time. Um, when I see Absolutely. lots of um, lots of things about the zombie apocalypse, um, I'm concerned that they're trying to create this fearful uh, view of the reality that there's going to be zombies marching around uh, to inject that into the collective consciousness as some sort of a toxic um, uh, injection um, to to distort reality and and the future that actually is coming. And so I think Absolutely. that uh, thoughts are very important at this time to look at. Uh, and the manipulation is so subtle and so brilliant. You know, people don't, mustn't underestimate the constant, continuous 
subtle indoctrination that we are exposed to, through electromagnetic waves, through frequencies, through cell phone towers, uh, cell phones that we use on a daily basis all the time, uh, television, the frequencies that those come through, radio, so everything around us is pretty much structured to control and manipulate us. Now, I cannot stress that enough. If, if people th that are unaware of this or they're new to this, you know, will very quickly jump up and down and say, oh, you're just a conspiracy theorist, you know, prove this, prove that. Well, you know what, we don't need to prove anything. Just open your mind, go and do some research, and you realize we are under absolute control. And uh, one of the greatest expressions I've started using recently, just, you know, it's an old expression, you know, don't worry, sir, everything is under control. And that's exactly what it is. Everything is under control. But let us come back to this new system, because if we're going to have a meltdown, whether it's a solar flare that causes a meltdown, whether it's a financial meltdown, which I also believe is imminent, that the entire social economic climate melts down and breaks down because it, I don't believe it can sustain itself for very much longer. Right. And if I... the financial system melts down and, mm. and just collapses, what are we going to do? Uh, it's very important for people to understand that money is not a natural process of evolution. Money was maliciously introduced by the royal political elite several thousand years ago as a tool of control. So they could control their subjects. So they introduced money, which was brought into the Sumerians by the Anunnaki, the gods, to introduce money into the system. So if, if there's a meltdown and money stops to exist uh, and the, the communication devices melt down and we go back to the Dark Ages, we need to have a system that we have at least thought about or embraced to be able to move ahead. Because what we can say with absolute certainty is when it does melt down, there'll be chaos on the streets. People will kill each other for a, loaf, for a loaf of bread. They'll kill each other for a glass of milk. They'll kill each other for a morsel of food. Now, that can, obviously cannot continue. That is not a sustainable, sustainable model. Okay? We need to look at something that is a united, a unified model, which unites people for a united strength, a unified strength where everybody contributes towards the greater benefit of all. Mm -hmm. And that is really the foundation of what I call contributionism, a whole new social structure that operates without money, without barter, without trade, without any value attached to anything, where everybody in their community contributes towards the greater benefit of all. And what you will find, I know we don't have much time left, so uh -huh. just need to put this out to the people. This is not going back to the Stone Age or to the Dark Ages. In fact, it is completely the opposite. It removes the hurdle. It removes money from the system. And since money is the hurdle and the obstacle to all progress, you're removing the hurdle to all progress. And I'm talking from whether you're a farmer or a shoemaker or a rocket scientist or whether you're an engineer, you have no hurdles or obstacles to what you want to contribute or achieve. And your passion is. So we will leap rapidly forward uh, into uh, an enlightened mm -hmm. spiritual age filled with conscious people that will have huge amounts of time to pursue their spirituality and the levels of consciousness will explode globally because people have, will have time to pursue the art and culture and spirituality because they'll no longer be chasing money or 90% of the time or more chasing mm -hmm. money so they can pay rent, buy milk and bread and pay electricity. All of that stuff is out of the window. We don't have to worry about and, that. And, so you know now, and, and this, is, this is the irony um, right here is that some people perceive when they don't understand the full message of what we're saying, that we're doom and gloomers. But I'm right with you, Michael, in that if we have a meltdown of the grid caused by a solar flare, so many things would change overnight. There would be turbulence. There would be rapes taking place and people being robbed. There would be this, this, this major chaotic time period. But there's no, uh, it doesn't mean it's going to stay like that forever. With all the information about what's possible already being out there, uh, outside the Pandora's box, with, with uh, those satellites, those, those weapons of war that are holding all these nations hostage, when that shifts, uh, if there's any technology that's out there in space that has been put out there to tamper with our brainwaves, which is very possible, people should also look in the work of Nick Begich. If something like that happens that disrupts those technologies, we can see a major shift in consciousness. Oh, I've also seen studies uh, that talks about solar Solar flares, solar activity, and its ties to geomagnetic storms, and geomagnetic storms and their ties to lucid dream states. And so, uh, yeah. I think uh, as we progress further in the future, things get more exciting because there are so many unknown things that can happen. Uh, there are so many different turns we can take, other than the zombie apocalypse into the world script scenario that clearly they want us collectively focused on. Yeah. Well, the, a world without money is the only way ahead. Uh, and I need people to, to go away and think about this. Uh, you know, when you tell people you're going to remove money from the system, they just go, oh, well, how are they going to work? Who's going who's mm. to pay for stuff and who's going to supply and provide all the stuff? 
You know, this is how poisoned our minds have become. This is how conditioned we have become. And without money, we can't survive. No, that is not true. Without money, we are doomed to slavery forever. You know, we need to remove money from the system, and the control collapses. I, whoever these people are that are controlling humanity, and we, that's a whole other debate, obviously. And whoever the, whether they're human or extraterrestrial or a combination, the, the moment you remove money from the system, you take away their control. Mm -hmm. It falls flat. And people, human beings, take control and the power back in their own hands. Communities start to govern themselves. They provide for themselves with ease because you've got brilliant minds in each community that can do brilliant things overnight. We're already doing brilliant things. Nothing, nothing has to change. The technology and the developments and the products that we do today can continue as they are, but they will dramatically change. There's a, there's a, there's a whole paradigm shift in every aspect of life to the way that communities are structured, the way that education happens, how children are brought up in their communities that are now children of the entire community and not just children of a family, and uh, how they are trained as they're growing up into whatever their natural mm -hmm. passion is or their God-given talent is, so that that then becomes what they end up contributing to the best of their ability, to the greatest benefit of all people in that community. And that is such a simple concept that it, it, it takes a while for some people to internalize it. But what I can also tell you, Alex, is that as alien and as utopian as it may sound to some people, it is actually a natural order of things. That's how things should be, because that's a, that is our natural extension of sacred geometry and the laws of nature. It's a continuation of the creative process that we as human beings are a physical extension of or an example of. We're just an, ex an example of a creative process of sacred geometry and the laws of the divine nature. And we must continue that in what we do as human beings in our lives towards our community and the greater benefit of all in that community. And uh, they must keep it up. People share this information with everyone you know. Once they have heard it, they cannot unhear it. I always remind people of that. That's true. Also, the greatest prison is worrying about what other people think about you. That's also from David Icke, and I think people should remember that when they um, uh, are, are slaves to the prisons of their own mind about what other people think about them.